something technical ish happens. <laughs> We're live. All right, so we will start right at four in two minutes. So until then, we'll just let people gather on the YouTube live stream. And then I'll do a short introduction and we'll go from there. Okay, so it's 20 minutes. Uh, how many minutes for presentation? I read 25. Oh, 25. Yeah, 20 to 25 okay. is sort of okay. what we have time for. Great. That's presentation and questions or just the presentation? So it'll be about 20 to 25 minutes for the presentation and then we'll follow it up with 10 or five to 10 minutes of questions. Depending okay. On the timing. Yeah, depending on how many questions there are. Cool. All All right, it looks like we've hit 4 p.m. So I'm going to stop sharing here and introduce our speakers. So hello and welcome everyone to the October 2020 Science Policy Hour entitled Washington on Fire. It's a very apt name given the events of 2020 and the wildfires we have experienced here in Washington and more broadly on the West Coast. My name is Juliana Brutman and I'm the president of the Washington State University Graduate and Professional Student Science Policy Initiative. I will also be the host for today's event. We have an exciting hour planned for today with Dr. Susan Pritchard and Dr. Ernesto Alvarado, who are fire experts at the University of Washington. Our discussion today will focus on identifying best practices for how scientists and the public can shape wildfire policy in Washington State. This event is formatted into two parts. First, we will hear from Dr. Pritchard speak for a 20 minute, for a 20 minute period, followed by a 10 minute question and answer session. Then we will hear from Dr. Alvarado for an additional 20 to 25 minute period, followed by another five to 10 minute question and answer session. For those of you who will be joining us on YouTube Live, please submit your questions for the speakers at any time during the presentation and then during the question and answer session, I will provide the speakers with the audience's questions for them to answer. So without further ado, I would like to introduce Dr. Prichard. Dr. Prichard is a fire ecologist at the University of Washington School of Environmental and Forest Sciences. Her work focuses on wildfire ecology, including wildfire management, changing landscapes, and the effects of global warming on fire seasons. Dr. Pritchard's work and expertise has been widely featured in both local and national news outlets. We look forward to the insights she will provide us today. And with that, Dr. Pritchard, the Zoom session is yours. Great. Hi, everyone. It's nice to see you um, or be with you. Um, it turns out that my internet connectivity is going to be a little bit low in my office. And so I'm afraid I'm going to need to just quickly take this over to another space where I can rely on the better connectivity. So I'll just be 30 seconds. Sorry about that. My apologies. Um, there we go. Okay, we will get going on this now. Great. Is everyone seeing that screen just fine? 
Okay. Well, um, the, the, my charge today is to talk about um, why are wildfires increasing in Washington State and in the Pacific Northwest so much so. I know that um, many of you have been following the news and um, hearing just about this uh, recent uptake in wildfires. And I wanted to start out with just a kind of something to clarify, which is, is that some of the news media, I think you've probably been following, has um, had this polarization of is this all climate change or is this something to do with forest management? And um, this diagram for me, this conceptual diagram really helps um, understand that any wildfire has um, something to do with climate as well as fuel, um, climate, weather, and fuel. And so um, just very basically, I think you can probably see my a mouse. Um, over on the climate limited ecosystems, we can imagine like Olympic rainforests of Olympic National um, Park have plenty of fuel to burn, but they're often too moist. If a um, fire tried to start there, um, the fuels wouldn't be conducive to burning. Um, over on the other side, we have systems that um, the climate's always dry enough pretty much to carry fire but um, the fuels are too um, discontinuous. There's not enough fuel to carry fire. So um, that would be our deserts. Well, um, many of us in Eastern Washington live in more of that sweet spot or Goldilocks um, spot where we have enough dry days in the summer to um, support fire because the fuels are dry enough um, and plenty of fuels for burning. And so, um, we can see down here that the fire occurrence generally is low in rainforest, highest in these middle kind of um, ecosystems, and then quite low in fuel limiting systems. What does this mean for climate change? Unfortunately for us, the scale is tipping where some of these climate limited systems like um, Western Oregon this summer become available for burning more often. And then conversely, some of the more dry um, areas that used to support fire might become more desert-like and not support fire. So um, anyway, fuels and climate change, they're all at work right now. Um, certainly we are seeing um, increased temperatures across the United States. Um, Washington is no exception to this pattern. And then that's coming with some pretty alarming projections for our state and across the Western United States about um, increase in area burn associated with warmer climate. Why is this? Well, in general, when the climate's warming, um, fuels warm up and then dry up earlier, especially um, summer snow melt um, happens sooner. And then the um, forests are more exposed to summer drying. So pretty much what we see is, is that our low fire years are associated with long some, um, snow periods where snow melt is later and we have a lot of potentially summer precipitation. And our high fire years are when we have that really long pronounced summer drought where a lot of fuels can um, dry up and be available for burning. And sure enough, yep, acres burning throughout the United States are um, going up. Check this out. Actually, the number of fires not necessarily going up. It's that um, these large wildfire events are getting bigger. So um, here's just another view of it for California, Oregon, and Washington. All of our states are really um, seeing quite a bit of variability year to year, but the trend is upwards in the acres burn. So yeah, you've been noticing a lot of talk in the news about increased wildfires, and they indeed are increasing. Now here's the kind of complicated part, which is that if we go back thousands of years for the Western United States and indeed the Pacific Northwest, um, we can see that um, this is kind of an average period that there's been um, a lot of cycling of how much um, uh, the Western United States has supported fire. And actually the last hundred years, um, we were in kind of a deficit of fire. And so even though we're talking about this big increase in fire, it's actually following a pretty significant fire-free period. So right in here. And so my next part of the talk is to just quickly talk about, well, what changed? Um, a lot of my conversation will be 
about Eastern Washington and Eastern Oregon, where we have the dry ponderosa pine forests and dry Douglas fir mixed conifer forests. So these forests historically had um, pretty frequent fires. We call them low to mixed severity fire regimes. I have often like to call these trees the char charismatic mega flora. Um, ponderosa pine in its um, beautiful open form fire maintained. Um, not all forests looked like this by any stretch of the imagination, but you can imagine if a fire did come through this park-like stand, um, it would burn lightly through um, tree needles and grasses and kind of just blitz through this and maintain this open forest. Um, in contrast, what we see a lot around where I live in Eastern Washington, and I'm sure you can take some walks um, near Moscow, Idaho and Pullman too, where you see um, ponderosa pine sometimes in these forests, but it now has a lot of neighbors. Um, a lot of um, neighbors means that um, when fire does come, it can burn very differently. These small trees can be called ladder fuels and carry a surface fire up into the canopy. And speaking of surface fuels, there's a lot of accumulated wood and litter um, and other debris that can really create a much more intense fire than what we saw in the previous slide with just that light grass and litter. So over time in this fire-free period, we've seen a lot of changes, both at the scale of a local patch of forest all the way to landscapes. And here we see some really cool repeat photography that was done from some um, original photos taken from fire lookouts and other places in 1930s compared to repeat photos taken in um, the 2000s. And you can see a lot of infilling here. Here too, I wanted to share this one because it also shows with infilling, we're not necessarily only getting an increased contagion to fire, but also to insects, forest insects such as bark beetles as shown here. So what were the ages of change? Um, actually, some of it is definitely fire suppression, um, putting out fires, but some of the, the list actually surprised me as I started digging into why did we have such an absence of fire um, back in the 20th century? Um, and there's a lot of different reasons for it. One is, is that um, native people, um, indigenous people were displaced um, and many of them actually had burning practices that contributed to frequent fire. Um, livestock grazing actually had a very surprising role. That grass that I showed in the Ponderosa Pine um, Forest was grazed really extensively by sheep and cattle in the late 1800s, early part of 1900s. Road and rail construction, some high grade logging that took out the big ponderosa pine trees that were so resistant to fire. And now we have climate change. I used to think this was mostly about Smokey the Bear and putting out fires, but the story's more complicated than that. I wanted to show you also one of the reasons we know that fire frequency has changed so dramatically is fire scar records. So this is a ponderosa pine tree that had um, on its bark um, a big cat face where it had been repeatedly scarred by um, fires starting in 1645 all the way up into 1883. And one of the distinctive things we see from a lot of these fire scars collected around the Pacific Northwest is an absence of fires right around 1883. This corresponds, here's um, a record of a lot of um, fire scars taken from Grand Canyon in Arizona. This one right here, this line of the last fire scars right around, I think it's 1878, corresponds when um, sheep were released in Grand Canyon National Park. So again, another evidence that um, widespread grazing had a big impact on putting out fires like these. So light surface fires, where if they don't have a lot of fuels, they might not spread. So in contrast, um, as forests have gone into really infilling, building into a lot of these multi-layered canopies, um, we're getting more of these fires, um, ones that are not so easy to put out and certainly would not be controlled by grazing. 
So I wanted to also just briefly mention that some of these departures in fire frequency um, also are, have been started to seeing up in the high elevations. These ecosystems up in the mountains didn't always have frequent fires. They might have fires every hundred years or so, but what has happened in these higher elevations, mostly through modern fire suppression, putting out fires, is we've lost this pock marking of many fires happening in very different places. And so the patchwork mosaic that used to be so common in the high elevations is being gradually filled in by trees. So um, let's fast forward to recent large fire events. There's certainly a big climate signal in these. Just seeing in 2015, um, I lived through a summer of major wildfires in our area of North Central Washington. A lot of this had to do with regional drought. So water deficits leading to a lot of forests being predisposed to burning. Um, I wanted to quickly just say that um, we are no strangers to large fires in my area. When I first moved to Winthrop, Washington, which is in North Central Washington State, a big fire was a tripod complex. And I studied um, a lot about the tripod um, back in the day. And then um, eight years later, we had another really large fire, the Carlton complex that burned 256,000 acres um, really close to my hometown. And then a year later, that 2015 year, that was such a big regional fire year, we had even more fires. And so my small town in North Central Washington has really seen a lot of large fire activity in our area. One of my big concerns as an ecologist is, is that um, in Ponderosa Pine dominated landscapes, I don't wanna see um, a post-fire landscape this, like this where so many of the trees for literally miles in this case have been killed by a high severity fire. And um, we've also talked quite a bit about after high severity fire events, we often have flooding and mass wasting events to go along with it. So I know that Ernesto is also going to get into what do we do about it, but I wanted to share just a little bit um, about some of the management implications that um, I've learned by studying these large wildfire events. I've been really interested in field treatment effectiveness research. So how can we get in before a large wildfire event and make a big difference? So I mentioned the 2006 tripod complex um, here on the left is what we would call a burned area reflectance classification. Um, the way that this image was created was taking a pre-burn satellite image and then a post-burn satellite image, overlapping them and calculating the difference in reflectance in areas that had a lot of change, meaning that there was high severity fire with 100%, almost 100% tree mortality would show up as very high reflectance, especially when the soils had burned too. Um, and then areas that are unburned would be very low change in reflectance. And so we've classified that to be red as high, orange, moderate, low as yellow and green and unburned. You can see a lot of this forested landscape burned in moderate and high severity. I was really interested to study this fire because I noticed right off the st um, start that some of these past wildfire events, there was a 2003 Isabel in Farewell Fire, 2001 um, 30 Mile Fire, and even a 1994 Thunder Mountain Fire and a 1970 um, Forks Fire, all were barriers to this fire spread. It had to actually, it was a big, big fire event, but it had to wrap around those past fires. Similarly, past um, forest thinning and prescribed burning were barriers to fire spread. In this photo, we see a really high severity fire event at the base of a forest thin, and then very little evidence of the fire within it. Um, there had been some old clear cuts where they'd done a broadcast or a site prep burn and then planted trees. And these looked really weird out in the post-fire landscape because we had nearly 100% tree mortality. And then these green islands of survivorship where there had been fire. So that's really encouraging that 
where we can get in advance of these large wildfire events, we can create more resilient forests. So this is just actually, I went a little bit too fast, but down here, there's big island of red where the tripod fire started and was very wind driven. And when you zoom in, you can see these islands of green where there have been past um, harvest and especially um, prescribed burns that made a difference. I also studied the 2014 Carlton complex. Same thing, but this fire was just so different. The tripod fire took two and a half um, months to actually burn, whereas the Carlton complex burned in a matter of days. A lot of its activity was one burn period. I didn't expect field treatments to be very effective with that much wind and that much intensity. And sure enough, this picture was taken from the Carlton complex. But we did find that um, field, past field treatments, especially thinning and prescribed burning did make a difference. And I was just gonna share one quick antidote, which is, is that this hatch marking here is a very large thin followed by a prescribed burn. It was around 2000 acres. The direction of the fire spread for the Carlton complex in that major spread day was from basically um, north, what, what would that be, north, west to southeast. And here, this was um, uh, this treatment was at a break in topography and also a big difference in fuels. And you can see that um, the fire severity was less in here. And it had also created an opportunity for the fire to continue heading to the southeast, but spared this area in the middle. And so that was a big success story for this treatment. All right. 2015, we're still studying it. It takes a long time to do good science, but I wanted to leave you with this perspective too. I mentioned that the tripod bumped into old fires. These fires are also bumping into one another. They didn't reburn one another. There can be reburns, but these were not ready to be reburned. Unfortunately, this is quite a large mosaic. It's not that patch mosaic that we saw in historical landscapes. Um, it's um, just really large wildfires. So a lot of my scientists, um, colleagues and friends are really talking about that we need some dramatic changes. So there was an article by Malcolm North, Reform Forest, Man Forest Fire Management, calling for an end to just suppressing all fires. We probably need some fires to restore that patchwork mosaic. Other articles are coming up with the fact that we got to do something different. Um, putting out fires in the middle of summer is not working very well. And so some people are calling to learn to coexist with wildfires. Um, I went the wrong way, sorry about that. Um, <laughs> so that's complicated though. So um, right now with all the major wildfires that we're getting, Forest Service, which is one of the um, main um, agencies that put out fires used to invest about 16% of their budget to fighting fires. Um, projected, it's now over two thirds of their budget. Unfortunately, this means that a lot of that work in putting in thinning and prescribed burning um, is hard to fund because what they're funding right now is fighting fires. I'm sure that Ernesto is going to mention that more. Um, I don't have time today to talk about um, all the work that we're doing on proactive management, but I do wanna leave you with um, a lot of hope that I think that right now we're getting um, very schooled by wildfires. They're, they're burning large and we're not on top of them, but there's some projects like um, our reburn project where we're doing simulations of what could be that offer um, an encouraging alternative that um, we can probably do a lot more with prescribed burning and even managing wildfires at the end of the season when snow is just about to happen um, that we can restore more of a resilient um, landscape so that we don't keep on getting these massive wildfires. When I end a lot of my presentations, I like to um, not just focus on the trees, but also some of the other fire adaptive vegetation that I live amongst. This um, landscape is really close to Winthrop, Washington, and the flowers, I'm sure a lot of you know what they are, are balsam root sunflower. And 
I just wanted to leave you with the fact that um, many of the ecosystems that we live amongst in Eastern Washington are fire adapted. And so even though we're hearing a lot about um, how destructive fires are in the news right now, they're also restorative. Um, and one example for this particular plant is, is that it's, it's built for fire. So Carlton Complex actually burned over a very similar landscape like this in the summer of 2014. And I went back a mere two months later, there'd been major rains afterwards. And I saw this individual um, balsam root sunflower had completely re-sprouted after the fire and then decided to uh, bloom in the fall. It's you know, usually a spring bloomer. But um, so I just wanted to let you know that even as we're talking about how to mitigate the um, damage of wildfires, they're also something that these ecosystems are built for and need. So with that, I just wanted to post some acknowledgements. And then um, I also wanted to just leave you with um, a little reminder here that if you haven't um, registered to vote right now, um, it's a really good time. So voters um, make a difference for fire policy too. So, all right, thank you. Thank you very much for an excellent talk, Dr. Pichard. That was very informative. I've certainly learned a lot. I'm sure our audience members did too. We have quite a few questions for you. Right. So, I'm so sorry about the snafu. It's, um, um, I'm not used to having poor internet where I was. Oh, no worries. So our first question is on the map that was presented. It looks like this one was submitted at the start of your presentation. Okay. It looks, so it says on the map that was presented, some areas of the South, I believe this is referring to the South of the United States, displayed projected temperature decreases. And the question was kind of the reverse here. What does that mean for wildfire ecology? If, you know, those very select few areas where it seems climate change is decreasing temperatures. Right. You know, um, I think that that's not my area of expertise. I'm trying to get back to that map just so that we can all see it together. Sorry, I'm being a little bit slow here. Um, so that area of the United States actually does have quite a bit of fire too. And I don't know what that will really mean for um, wildfires. A lot of my talk actually has much more to do with the Western United States that has a prolonged summer drought. That's not the case for the Southeast. They actually have quite a bit of moisture in the summertime. So it's out of my area of expertise, yeah. Awesome, so our next question then is, since you showed how historical fires have bumped into each other, mm -hmm. but haven't reburned areas, with these new areas reaching the sweet spot where fuel and temperatures allow them to burn, do we expect a downtime while burn severity is lower before fuel accumulates again? Um, I love that question. That is such an awesome question. So um, whoever asked it probably should have been a reviewer on some of the early modeling projections for increased area burned um, in the Western United States because some of those early models forgot to include the fact that for a time, fires are a barrier to spread. So fires can be a negative feedback to future fires for a time. And so that's now been built into some of the modeling to correct for some of the dire predictions of area burned. Um, still dire, but not as dire. And so in this landscape, um, we get a lot of snow in the winter. And so that long snowpack um, lasts all the way sometimes until June in this high country. And so, um, some of these areas are not very productive. And so these past fires last for up to 20 to 30 years. That would not be the case, say, in Northern California. You might expect a fire to be a barrier to spread for just a couple years, depending on if grasses come back. So it really depends on how protective the, productive the ecosystem is and what actually is carrying the fire. Is it um, grasslands, shrublands, or does it just remain sparse for a long time? So that's really interesting. And we have two more questions here. So the next one is with the increasing intensity of wildfires, what are the potential impacts on human settlements? And the kind of example that was given here is insurance co companies continuing to cover houses and in high risk areas. Is that 
would you say sustainable going forward? Yeah, that's such a great question. I know that um, where I live, um, the amount of taxpayer dollars that go into protecting our communities is not trivial. I actually would like to um, do just a quick and dirty um, calculation, but um, I think that the quick and dirty that I did to start out with says that Washington and well, national taxpayers have paid at least $5,000 per resident in our community for battling these wildfires to protect where we live. And um, that's a big number. So every one of us is very much sub subsidized living here. Insurance companies are definitely considering um, withdrawing coverage. I actually have a friend who works high up in PEMCO insurance. And I've asked him about this because I would like to see incentives for people to do a lot of firewise um, or fire adopted communities work around their landscapes so that their home and their immediate landscaping is not so vulnerable to fire. I'd like insurance companies to do that approach rather than just mapping fire hazard over large areas because I think a lot of us can do mini fuel treatments where we live and make a big difference. Awesome, and we have one more question for you from your talk. So what are some action steps that concerned citizens can take to improve resources for wildfire fighting? I think you kind of touched on this a bit with voting, but at the yeah, state I did. level. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm not joking with the voting. Like, like our, our votes really matter right now in terms of supporting science-based management on our landscape. So um, I've never added that to my talk, but it is a um, timely addition um, right now. But um, in addition, what concerned citizens can do, for one is um, for those of us that live in fire prone areas, um, we need to shift our thinking from, if it's a matter of if a fire comes, but to when, um, and really expecting that we're gonna have a fire in our community and start being prepared. I mean that because when we um, make our homes less um, volatile for wildfires, we protect firefighters too. And so I take that really seriously where I live and I think it's a really important message for people to have. Um, and then in terms of another way that I think we can support um, firefighters and fire management in general is, is that we need a lot more prescribed burning. And unfortunately that comes with smoke. And so the more that we can get out the word that um, there is a type of good fire that's missing from a lot of these landscapes and we need to support it and take some little doses of smoke along the way is a really important one. Fantastic. And those are all the questions okay. that were submitted. So thank you very much for that excellent talk and your time. Really appreciate it. Oh, thank you. It. it was my pleasure. And so next, we're going to transition along to our second speaker, uh, Dr. Ernesto Al Alvarado. And so Dr. Alvarado is a research associate professor at the University of Washington School of Environmental and Forest Sciences as well. Um, he is a wildlife biologist associated with the United States Forest Service Fire and Environmental Research Applications Program. His research program includes wildlife, wildfire sciences, tropical ecology, and quantitative fire ecology modeling. Dr. Alvarado has also, also has extensive experience with forest management as a visiting scientist in other countries, such as Mexico, Paraguay, Bolivia, and Brazil. And we look forward to learning from Dr. Alvarado today. And with that, the Zoom session is yours. Thank you. Well, thank you. And uh, can you hear me? Yes. OK, I'm going to share my screen. And uh, let me know if uh, uh, my screen is not moving, because uh, I've been having troubles lately with my screen. But, OK. Uh, I work at the University of Washington, and I, I like to start off this conversation by acknowledging that the, the University of Washington, the land where it sits, is the land of the Coast Salish peoples, Native Americans. The land that touches the shared waters of all tribes and bands within the Suquamish, Tulalip, and Muckleshoot nations. This is very important for me because uh, 
Uh, I do a lot of work in Eastern Washington, and I work in the Yakima Reservation, the Colby Reservation, and also in where are the ceded lands, and they are now federal lands, forest service lands. The topics I was given, I hope I will be able to cover all of them, is what is fire policy, and how science informs fire policy, and if there are any, any suggestions about informing uh, policy makers, local communities about fire policies. And so I frame my conversation about uh, one slide I always use in my presentations in, uh, in Latin America or Portugal, where I've been a, a visiting scientist. And most of these countries uh, are trying to follow the uh, example of the United States who is now into the fire management. The United States shifted to fire management in the fire management in the sixties. So most of the countries that are following the uh, they see the United States uh, the the example to follow. They they were into the fire suppression. Many of them they are still in fire suppression mode, but they use the word fire management. And what is fire management? Uh, and how we get there? So we need a fire policies to support ecosystem management. So we have to have ecosystem management, and then we have to have policies. To develop those, we need a, a, something that was touched at the end by Susan. We need consistency between government programs. To have a successful fire program, fire management program, or ecosystem management program, we need consistency. And right now, there is no consistency in what we have in, in between federal government and states. There is no consistency in the message we're getting across uh, in terms of uh, fires. Uh, we need to recognize the, and communicate the ecological role of fire, uh, which was a great presentation from Susan. But also we need to increase the use of fire, educate public and owners. And to recognize that is, uh, we need to use prescribed fires, but prescribed fires have a short-term and also long-term uh, effect uh, uh, over time. We need to keep supporting and improving the firefighting capacity. It's not because we are moving away from fire suppression, we should discard the firefighting capacity. We need to in increase it. We need to assess, to manage, and share the fire risk not just among managers, uh, scientists, academicians, but also the general public, politicians, decision makers. So that's the, my take, and I'm going to try to cover some, uh, some of these uh, concepts in the, in the, within the United States, and some of this is applicable to other countries. Uh, mute i don't know if i was mute before because i got a message that i've been mute i think we can hear you now okay. we're able to hear you again okay did you hear me before because i got a message that you are mute i think it muted for a little bit of time but it didn't look like you were talking okay. during that time period so okay so uh we have science we have developed science over so many years science that have been, have been developed not just in the united states but europe and other countries and we know that for instance uh, how much it burns every year about half of china in terms of the area and of course it uh, is china and the united states are about the same size similar sizes it's about uh, 500 million hectares per year how much it burns three eight to eight percent of the npp uh, that excluding fuel wood, deforestation, tropical agricultural development, etc. Et About almost 10% of the total terrestrial NPP goes up in the smoke every year. Uh, fires are very sensitive to climate change. Uh, and also, of course, uh, because it's sensitive to climate change, uh, the alteration of terrestrial carbon is very sensitive. The frequency and intensity of wildfires are also sensitive to climate change and land use practices. Uh, ecosystems are an expression uh, are an expression of a climate, soil disturbances, and land use patterns. 
So we should never forget land use patterns because that's, it means a, a lot in terms of fire. Fire is part of the most ecosystems, either natural or not, including tropical ecosystems. But also fire is, an, is, a, is a tool used by ancient, by, by indigenous communities for, for, for immemorial time or millennia. So in addition to the problems, the natural problems, the ecological problems we have, there are new, new issues that, uh, uh, that are emerging. The wildland neural interface is growing. Smoke emissions are increasing and affecting more and more people over, uh, in the entire world and not just the United States. And you were aware of this summer of what happens when fires burn everywhere. Uh, firefighting and community safety as uh, one of the issues. Fire escapes endangered wildlife, public and community health. We have climate change now. We cannot ignore climate change. It, it's real and it's here and it's affecting our fires, uh, our ecosystems. Uh, fires move across multiple boundaries and even uh, move, they move across countries. Uh, forest health is declining. So those are emerging issues, and, and there are many several other issues that we need to deal with. But one of the things, uh, how we got to this point, to this uh, issue that we have, uh, especially in the West, uh, we are an immigrant culture. And I'm from Mexico. I'm an immigrant. I recognize I'm an immigrant. And I'm very proud of it. However, we are an immigrant culture, the entire United States. Most of the, if you are Native American, you are not immigrant. The rest, we are immigrants, and we'll, you will see in a minute why, what I mean. But when we move to um, one place, we bring our culture, we bring our customs, we bring our knowledge. And natives have been living here for millennia, for immemorial time. So, But this, uh, the knowledge they have uh, is not unique to them. We can learn that. And the traditional knowledge is something that we can learn from living in, uh, in the intimacy and pay, paying attention to the homeland. And we don't have to be, like I say, Native Americans, as long as we are integrated in this uh, landscape, with these ecosystems. And if we want to be successful in this continent and modern world, we need to become indigenous to this place. We need to start engaging and the process to become indigenous to this place. So what is uh, uh, becoming indigenous to this place? America is a fire continent. It burns. It has burned for millions of years. We have to live with fire. We have to adapt to fire. And of course, we need to develop native knowledge, the knowledge that is specific for this place of the, uh, of the world and especially the West. And what I mean by being a, a, an immigrant culture, let me just show one slide from a friend of mine uh, who is a Native American in, Port, in Oregon. In 1841, 70 wagons came across the Oregon Trail. Uh, by 1840, 1845, there were 3,000 wagons. So in, less, in five years, it went from 70 to 3,000. The Euro-American population in 1841 in Oregon was 700 people, U.S. citizens, non-natives, and no blacks, and no Mexicans. In 1860, there were 52,000 people. So why they kept good track of how many people were? Because if they, uh, uh, to, be, to be a state, to reach the statehood, they needed 50,000 people. Uh, U.S. citizens, not people, U.S. citizens. Uh, Washington reached a statehood in 1889. So about 50,000 people in this, about the same time. Uh, Oregon has 4.2 million people. That's uh, from 2019 records. And Washington, 7.6 million people. The population of Native Americans declined. And this is just uh, one record from the Kalapuya tribe, uh, in 12 years went from 13,000 to 300. And of course, uh, due to missiles and the Indian wars. California, 
California at the end at the at the end of the 20th century, uh, I mean 19th century, early in the 20th century, the population of the entire state was less than two million people. You move to 2015, it's 40 million people, and right now it's uh, past 40 million people. So we have a uh, in people who are coming from, uh, from different parts of the world, different parts of the United States, moving in large um, amount of people to one land, to uh, where we have natural ecosystems, or we also had Native Americans living here. So what we brought when uh, we moved to this uh, part of the world, and I moved here in 33 years ago, so I'm new. Concepts of property and those concepts of property and the knowledge of ecosystems that were developed somewhere else. And most of them, they were developed, they were generated in Europe. And in different types of uh, forests, different types of environments that they were not the Western North America. Uh, for most of the 20th century, the forests, the forests of the West, were, they were managed with the European forestry model. That where timber is the, the objective, timber is the commodity. Sustained yield was seen as a production of volume. And mostly you, you need a single species, a few species. So it took us, uh, it took, I mean, I mean, I'm including me here. Uh, it took us uh, all, more than a century to start uh, generating native science to manage our native ecosystems. The uh, late 19th century, half of the 20th century, uh, most of the fire policies that we had were based on, again, the knowledge we had from somewhere else. And they were not specific for the type of uh, uh, management, the type of ecosystem, the uh, type of management needed here in the, in the West. Uh, people started moving to the West. And some of those people came from Midwest. The Midwest at the end of the 19th century, they had huge fires. This is, in 1971, there was one uh, fire in Peshtigo, Wisconsin, where there were 1,500 casualties. People died. In 1884, uh, in uh, Minnesota, there was another fire that, burned, that killed 418 people. So fires are also not, they're not, uh, um, uh, foreign to the Midwest. There were fires. It killed tons of people. But there were no institutions to gather political support. Moving to the, uh, to the West and in general in the United States, uh, the institutional uh, the institutions begin. The federal institutions to protect the land to create the national forests, the national parks, the forest reserves. They, they started at the end of the uh, 19th century. In 1897, there were 40 million acres in forest reserves, but there was no management in place. This is the, the first uh, fire policy, written fire policy. There was a memo from uh, one of the, I believe was one of the district rangers or forest supervisor is take horses and get control of the forest fire situation on as much as the mountain country as possible. That's the first written policy in the federal government. You just go and fight every single fire. Uh, Gifford Pinchot, the first uh, chief of the uh, forest service, uh, actually he was the, the chief of the division of forestry before the forest service was created. And he got this uh, idea. They need, he needed to reduce the losses from forest fires. And his goal was to reduce the fires, the losses, no more than $20 million. This is 1898. So that's economics. Uh, they're not ecological, that was economics. And moving into 1905, the Forest Service is created. Before the 1905, the forests were in the Department of Interior. The foresters, the people who were doing the management, they were in the Department of Agriculture. In 1905, they put them together in the same place, in the Department of Agriculture, which is now, now the Forest Service. The Forest Service, when it was created in uh, those days, it was uh, doomed. It was almost 
disappearing, but there was a big fire. A big fire that started in uh, 1910. It created a major change in, uh, uh, in the attitude of uh, people. Uh, that's when fire exclusion started. This fire exclusion started in 1910 uh, as a policy. In 1911, that's when the Congress, by consensus, everybody voted in favor of this. They created the uh, Weeks Act that gave the authority to the Forest Service to purchase the land of, for national forest. Also fostered the state fire programs with federal funds. And so it's a direct impact of the political, uh, of the, this uh, large fire. And this one is part of the full fire suppression policy that we are we have and uh, uh, some of the slides that Susan was showing, they come from as a consequence of this uh, fire. So in terms of uh, policies, we had uh, early in the, uh, in, the, in the creation, after the creation of the Forest Service, we had the uh, policies that were uh, forming uh, after the Forest Service, uh, Forest Service was created. Uh, and the, the formative years were between 1905 and to 1911, before that big fire and before it was, the Forest Service was given the authority to go full suppression. Uh, most of the forestry schools in the, in the West, they were created in 1905, 1907. Uh, University of Washington started in 1907. Washington State, University of Idaho in 1905, I believe. During these years, there was a controversy of uh, if the light fires, the natural fires that the people were seeing were okay or not. Uh, there was a big controversy. Uh, fires were historically happening or occurring uh, between five to 15 years, and that one was maintaining the ecosystem stability. But of course, uh, fires kill the small trees. And killing the small trees is the future crop of uh, trees. So it's not compatible with forest management. So that's why we went to full fire suppression. And uh, fires were common. Uh, were so common that people were realized that there are, people are burning. Native Americans are burning. And uh, uh, some of the early writings, for instance, Berker in 1912, he says, all the methods of using fire as a servant, the light burning, theory is the oldest, the most important, and the, at the same time, the most undesirable and the most mischievous from the standpoint of forestry. And uh, one more, uh, the, the, uh, one of the top conservationists of this country, uh, Aldo Leopold, he wrote in 1920, it is of course absurd to assume that the Indians fire the forest with any idea of forest conservation in mind. He changed his mind later in the 40s, but uh, that was his early writing. So fire exclusion wins. And we go fully fire exclusion because of this, uh, the uh, report of the light burning committee. And by 1950s, there was, uh, some people started raising red flags. There were two people in the, uh, one in BIA, Harold Weaver. He was the BIA forester. And uh, Harold Biswell, uh, from professor from University of California. They started realizing that the dry forests of the west of the Cascades, the west of the Sierras, uh, dry, uh, needed fire. And they were working mostly with uh, the ponderosa pine type of forest. Consolidation years from 1911 to 1968. Uh, 1924, the Clark-McNary Act gave the authority to purchase more land and incorporate more land into national forest and also gave the authority and the uh, economic support to create the state forestry programs. So most of the forestry programs in the United States, they were, uh, they were after the, uh, funded by the Clara, Claire, Clark McNary Act. 1935, official start the 10 a.m. policy. Uh, 1950, the, all the su surplus that came from uh, the Second War, was incorporated into fire management. 1963, that's when fire management, uh, ecological work started in the United States. And 10 a.m. policy. Perhaps I don't have much, much time to talk about the 10 a.m. policy, but 10 a.m. policy is perhaps uh, one of the 
policies that have been the effect have been lasting for more than 100 years. That one was a blank check to go full suppression. And what the policy says, fire con the fire agencies will organize as to have sufficient strength to control every fire within the first war period. Should this not occur, the attack is success succeeding day, will be planned and executed to obtain control before 10 a.m. of the next morning. So this policy tells what to do in the initial attack and what to do if the initial attack fails. And no matter how much resources you, 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 you need, you just, you just go and ask. And that is a blank check to do full fire suppression. Uh, what are the economic bases? And that's the just going to cover quickly. The economic basis of the 10 a.m. policy is the more you spend on resources, and that's the line that goes from the zero axis all the way to the, to the right, the primary protection. The more you spend, the losses are less. And that was the 10 a.m. policy, the economic basis of the 10 a.m. policy. So you minimize. If you add the, every point of the expense plus the losses, you end up with a curve in, on the top, and that's the total cost plus liability. And what this what this is is uh, you have an optimal level, but it's basically based on the expenditures and the losses. And the losses are of course timber. This last uh, slide I'm going to show uh, the new era in fire management is uh, started in 1968 when the 10, 10 a.m. policy was uh, put into shelf. It was not the official, it stopped, actually ends the, 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 the 10 a.m. policy, the federal government ended that. But also incorporation of uh, prescribed burning started in the 60s in the national parks and then in the 70s in the national forest. One of the problems we have right now, and Susan mentioned that in the slide with the, the cost of uh, fight, fighting fires, is the costs are going up. And in 1979, Congress mandated the Forest Service to do a cost benefit analysis for all the fire management uh, operations. There are new policies out there that uh, they're just uh, uh, changing, they have been changing over time. The, the current policy that we have was developed in 1995. Is based on economic efficiency and introduced the use uh, fire use as a, as a practice. Uh, in 2001, there was a, it was reviewed, but it didn't change it. it just uh, ratified that the 1995 was still valid. That was during the, the Clinton administration. Uh, during the Bush administration, uh, he issued the, he signed the Healthy Forest Restoration Act uh, to contain the, the cost. That didn't work much. And uh, during the Obama administration, we had two pieces of legislation. One is the Flame Act, uh, which was the a solution to the to try to contain, not to contain, to actually provide funding for firefighting and the uh, fire management strategy. I think I'm going to stop here. Um, I can go on and on and talking about fire policies, but. Uh, it is very interesting that we have uh, over these uh, uh, hundred years, we have several lessons. And uh, one of them is uh, uh, we went full fire suppression, but it worked well too much. We end up with the ecological problem we have. So the fire we have are a result of that policy and climate change. Uh, I'm going to stop here, and if you have any questions, I think it's about my 20 minutes. That was fantastic. Thank you. And there are questions that were submitted for you. So the first question that was put out there is, globally, how does ecosystem management differ from continent to continent? Is the US seen as leading the world in this area, or are some of the US practices adopted from European countries? The <laughs> very interesting question. Some countries follow the United States and Canada example, the science developed in these two countries. 
the Canadian system of uh, ecosystem management and fire management uh, has been implemented in countries like uh, uh, New Zealand, uh, some parts of Europe. Some countries they have a very close association to, with the United States. The Forest Service has been providing assistance. Latin American countries, they still follow, several countries, they follow the European model because of the Spain, Spanish model because of the language, language barriers and all that. And ecosystem management changes differs every, in many countries and uh, uh, the tropics, every country is different. There is no homogeneous approach to conservation in, even in Latin America, in South America. Brazil follows one direction which changes every time they have different president. Bolivia has different direction, same thing. They have different presidents and the approach to management is completely different. And uh, in terms of ecosystem management and conservation, for instance, Brazil is, is about reserves, setting aside land. The approach they have in conservation in Bolivia is trying to manage the land. They give concessions, millions of acres to, or hectares to private companies to manage on their uh, low impact logging. So you have logging approach to harvesting, to conservation and setting aside reserves in Brazil. It's the same forest. So yes, there is a lot of, uh, lots of lack of knowledge in uh, everywhere in terms of uh, what is the role of fire? We know in the United States, but it's specific for, just like I started my conversation, that knowledge is specific for the Western United States. That doesn't apply uh, in tropical countries. Some people have been trying to apply it and with not much success. It's really interesting. So our next question is, how does the destruction of the Amazon rainforest for agricultural purposes impact fire in that region? Is the destruction of native, native forests accelerated increases? accelerating increases, excuse me, in wildfire intensity in the remaining forested areas? The, uh, it's a pretty heavy word, the destruction, but yeah, it, we have to accept that it's destruction. <laughs> they suffer the same uh, problem we had in the Western United States where people are moving into a different place with different type of uh, agricultural systems, different way of producing food. Uh, the Amazon, the population of the Amazon was mostly native until the 70s. In the 1970s, Brazil started a program to move people from uh, the Pacific coast, from uh, the Atlantic coast, I'm sorry, from uh, Rio de Janeiro, Sao Paulo, Salvador, where those cities are in the tens of millions of people. They started moving to the Amazon, millions of people. They arrived to, to a new place and they used to grow beans and crops from the other places, crops from the savannas. They move into the tropical forest. They are given 50 hectares and they have to live out of those 50 hectares. What they do, they deforest. They have to deforest to grow their food, the food they are used to. And uh, pretty soon these 50 chunks of 50 hectares, they, they are abandoned or sold to ranchers. And eventually you, you have a, uh, land moving into uh, uh, cattle production. So you have deforestation now from moving from a small farmers or a small owners, private owners into large uh, ranches. So if you want to uh, grow something in the Amazon, you have to burn and you have to burn very often. You have to, you want to maintain an open forest, an open, I'm sorry, open savannas, open grasslands, you have to burn every three years. And the need of producing more and more beef uh, requires uh, opening the forest in more and more land. So that's why uh, when you see the spikes of deforestation in Brazil, it's uh, in the 70s was pretty high and then it goes uh, again in the 90s. Uh, now the, the big market in is, and again, the Amazon is providing the, uh, those goods is soybean. Soybean production is a, international market it has it's well paid pays more than beef now the deforestation goes to produce for producing uh, soybean so you have this uh, 
international markets, demand for uh, beef, for now soybean and uh, some other products. And so you have a, a deforestation. Every hectare deforested is one hectare burnt. And you have fragmentation and then you have fires moving into this new, the open forest. So you, it's a more dynamic system than the Western United States. It took us here 100 years to reach to the crisis point where we are. Brazil is there for a long time. And now they are moving into, because it's too dynamic, uh, they, 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 if you reach, if they reach uh, about 25, 30% of deforestation, they reach tipping point where there won't be return. That's very interesting. We have one more question for the seminar today. And so are there any good examples of non-Euro American forestry models incorporating multiple tree species for timber production? Or is timber demand too high to use other methods? Uh, one of the best uh, examples we have of uh, the new forestry is Jerry Franklin's teachings, the, the book of Jerry Franklin, Ecosystem Management. That's, for me, is one of the best books on how to manage forests in the West. For uh, most of the 20th century, all the forests of the West were managed under the German uh, forestry model where you have to ma maximize volume. And the way to maximize volume is by keeping few species and all these trees, all these species, they grow homogeneously. So you have continuous flow. You have sustainability of production. Uh, one thing we, rec we recognize now is that's not a model applicable to the Western United States. You have to manage multiple species. You have to manage landscapes. You have to manage now uh, different ownerships. Uh, and, and of course, uh, the demand for timber has uh, decreased. The big demand, demand for timber in, in the United States was when you, when I show you the, the California example, where people were building homes. And after the Second World War, people were coming back from, uh, from Europe and Japan. And they, uh, in the 50s, there was a big demand of uh, houses. Now we don't have that demand, but now we have all these trees there, but they are smaller, smaller trees. So the, uh, the industry of the 21st century won't look as the last century. And that's one of the main failures of uh, the policies that we, they are trying to implement or they are trying to suggest the federal government in California, forest management. Those trees are not there. The volume is not there. The, the species are not uh, the, the the species and the volume uh, the the composition of this is not there, and also uh, most of the West has lost the capacity of uh, harvesting under the European model. Sawmills, timber industry, uh, by the by 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 large, they are, disappear. We don't have loggers. We have people trained on how to cut trees. And we have different types of products. So the 21st century forest industry has to be different from just producing timber. And that means we have to look into not just one species, which, for instance, Douglas fir or ponderosa pine, the most high palatable trees in, in the West. We have to look at other species and, not just, and different sizes, not just the big trees, the old growth. When Europeans arrived here, they saw old growth, they saw big trees, they have been growing for centuries and it's not there anymore. Fantastic. Well, with that, we are going to wrap up our seminar first day. I wanna thank doctors Richard and Alvarado again for their really excellent presentations. I think this has been a great crash course, at least for me, and probably those who have been watching and just fire policy and fire management and ecosystems in general on the West Coast and throughout global, the, the world with some of Dr. Alvarado's talk. And it was great. I also want to say thank you to the GPS SPI members. So this 
seminar was the brainchild of Hallie Weimer, who has been managing our technology throughout uh, the seminar today. And also I want to thank Hayden Wright for managing the YouTube chat and Ben Lee for managing other aspects of this event. And so with that, I think we're gonna end the live stream and thank you all to tuned in for today's event. Thank you for the invitation. Goodbye. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.